so we've done a handful of cowboy boots in the cowboy boot series but they've all been fairly pricey and some people aren't willing to spend 500 bucks or a thousand bucks on a cowboy boot and some people aren't willing to take that gamble on their first pair of cowboy boots to try out the style see if they like it see if they feel comfortable in it enough to pull it off and thanks to huckberry for sponsoring this video and to make this as fair and transparent as possible Rhodes, who makes this boot, is an exclusive house brand of Huckberry. And if you don't know who Huckberry is, they're equal parts store, magazine, and inspiration. And their slogan is gear for today, inspiration for tomorrow. And if that means nothing to you, they have, basically what they are, they have got tons and tons of cool stuff. And if you're into boots, they have everything to accompany your boots, like clothes, EDC gear, uh, hygiene stuff. They've got even, they've even got like a bunch of home things like uh, sheets and a bunch of other stuff like that. And so to give you a brief history of Huckberry and how they started, the idea for Huckberry started on a chairlift in Tahoe between the founders Andy and Rich. And they worked on the idea over the various weekend ski trips and was officially founded in San Francisco in 2011 and pushed the whole project live during another one of their ski trips in 2011. They continued to grow and slowly bring in more and more products. And then by 2016, they opened their second office and distribution center in Columbus. Then also in 2016, they acquired their first brand in Flint and Tinder. And since then, they've built a family of house brands, including Proof, Wellen, and Rhodes. And then in 2018, Huckberry opened their first brick and mortar pop-up in the West Village in New York City, which was part store and part speakeasy, which was really cool. And then they opened their third office and moved the headquarters to Austin in 2020. And now in 2022, they have locations in Austin, San Francisco, and Columbus. And so now they've built this, this empire of curation and cultivating a very specific uh, group of products and they're they're pretty much unmatched in their style of what they curate and what they offer up on their website so I had to re-record a bit of this leather portion because I called this a new buck leather but it's a corrected grain that's waxed essentially it's the same thing where they just lightly sand the top surface of the leather that removes some of the, the imperfections and scars and gives it kind of a matte finish. Well, with the corrected grain that's waxed, all they do is take a layer of wax and just lightly put a coat on top to give it a little bit more of a sheen and a, and a higher finish rather than that kind of fuzzy suede nubuck or a, what do you call it, microfiber texture on top. And the way we're gonna judge this is still off the cross section and the finish and everything. So the first thing we looked at was the cross section. You can see there's plenty of grain still left in there. So they haven't sanded super far into the grain, which is good to see. And if you put the macro lens on top, you can see there's certain spots where you can see that really high sheen from the wax finish on top. And then if we just lightly remove some of that wax, you can see what I mean by that suede microfiber nubuck texture underneath the wax. And just to double check, we wanted to burn this leather to make sure there wasn't any really heavy plastic coating on top or infused into the leather. We burned it and as you can see, it's burnt the leather. There's nothing like really plasticky in this leather. So if I were to grade this leather, I would consider it an A grade leather because of how much grain, because of the non-plastic finish and because of there's not a fake print embossed into it. And this leather is fairly thick at two millimeters thick, which is I, th I believe the thickest leather we've seen in a cowboy boot so far, which is kind of surprising for the the kind of your entry level affordable $200 boot. But here's a quick graph, actually I'll put it on this side. Here's a quick graph of all the different thicknesses and we're gonna do just do the graphs across this entire video because we've done so many cowboy boots at this point that it's not, it's just, it'd, be it'd take me forever to be like, this is this, this is this, and go through them on all these points. So graphs. And also in tradition with the cowboy boot series, you gotta do the rattlesnake test, see how many pounds it takes to pierce through the upper. And this took 72.5 pounds to pierce through. And then once again, here's your graph. And then if we move to the inside of this boot, you can see it's a fully lined boot. It looks more like a cow skin or calf skin, but if you just look at the, the texture on this and the pore structure, it has a lot tighter pores like a, a cow skin. But either way, it doesn't really matter that much what it is because it's a pretty high quality leather. It does have a really heavy pigmented finish on top, but it does have some grain in the cross section and it's fairly thick for a lining leather at one millimeter, or at least, thick enough for a good lining leather at one millimeter. And so if I were to grade this lining leather, this would be like a B grade leather. So significantly better than the thousand dollar Lucchese's that had that ripped pig skin and better than some of the other boots that we saw like in the Tony Llamas was not the, the best lining leather. So for 200 bucks, the leather already is pretty decent. And then if we move further inside the boot, you can see that this boot does not have that rolled edge on the inside where all these layers come together. And you can see that there is a permanent insole in there and it's a leather topped 
pour on layer. So some people are not gonna like that because if you have custom orthotics or you like to swap out your insoles to, to change the sizing or whatever arch support, this is permanent and so you're not gonna be able to pull it out, but you also don't have to worry about it like shifting and moving around. So there's pros and cons to each to each. And then if we look at the outsole, a full leather outsole, so just like the rest of the traditional cowboy boots we've cut apart, and they also come in a wedge sole, which I really like because this is a really thin, slim wedge sole and it drops the heel really low and it just makes for a really comfortable kind of uh, pull on roper boot. But the more traditional one is the full leather. And it, so it is good to see that it's a full grain, full leather outsole. And we put it on the puncture test or the, yeah, I guess the puncture test, it's not the rattlesnake test, the grab weight test, if, if anyone knows that reference. The Rhodes Roper took 280 pounds to pierce through. Compare that to the rest of them and pretty impressive. And then if we look at the heel, this is another spot where we've seen a lot of boots go cheap on and find cheaper alternatives, um, the heel stack. It's, look, for, for instance, the Alden Indy boots for $610, they weren't a full leather heel stack. It was like a leather board, but this heel stack is full leather. It's, it's multiple layers of leather. And the thing that I like about this top or this heel is it's a really low heel. And Roper boots are usually less intricately designed or like the, they don't have a lot of like, uh, stitching on the upper. They usually have a lower heel. They usually have a flat heel. And so a roper makes a really good option for a first cowboy boot because of its more subtle styling. And next, let's talk about the construction because that's, you know, we've got a lot of good leather in the upper, good leather in the, the outsole construction. And usually if they're gonna hide something, they start at the construction. So I was worried that this was gonna be like a fake Goodyear welt and it was just gonna be cemented. But if you, a, a quick way to tell if something's truly Goodyear welted is you can s just lightly pull away the upper. And if you can see those little stitches on the inside, they kind of bulge out the leather in certain spots. That's a good indicator that it's a good year welted boot without needing to completely cut it in half and without needing to trust the brand to tell you the truth because half the time brands are off on how their boots are made, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So, true 270 Goodyear welt and nailed at the heel. And the welt itself is usually another thing they, they kind of cheapen on. And they usually do like a synthetic welt just to save a few dollars, but this is a full leather welt as well. And usually I don't talk too much about the fit of the boot aside from like arch support and stuff, but this boot might be a little bit tricky for you guys that have really thick ankles and a, a really meaty foot or a high instep because this shaft is really, really slim. In order to keep that dress slash cowboy slash slim silhouette, they've kept the shaft really small and some people can't get their foot in it. So if you get a pair of these and you can't get your foot in it, there's a little trick that I learned from Carl Morawski who learned it from John Lofgren who makes like some of the highest end uh, engineer boots. If you can't get your ankle in a boot, what you need to do is take your an old shopping plastic bag, put your foot in the shopping bag, and slip your boot into the boot, your foot into the boot. Because what that does is that, that plastic bag allows your foot to slide in a lot easier than either skin on leather or sock on leather. So what you do is you wear this, the, that plastic bag around your foot, around the house for a few nights as this slowly stretches out to shape to the shape of your foot and it allows you to, to eventually sneak your foot in there without needing a plastic bag. So keep that in mind when you're considering these boots. The real story of this boot is probably on the inside because they had to have, they've had to change some materials to get this boot to a certain price point. And nine times out of 10, that all happens on the inside of the boot. So let's cut it in half and see how they got this down to that $200 price point. All right, we got it cut in half and let's see what's inside. I only cut one of them too because I selfishly asked him to send me this pair for my own personal use because I like the low heel and everything. So we're not cutting it in half, but assume it's built in the same way. So let's see what's inside.
So a, a fair amount of synthetic materials on the inside, but that's kind of what we expected for a $200 boot. Because you've got to find your price savings somewhere, whether it's through the materials or labor or where it's manufactured. And clearly they've done this, got this price down by putting some more synthetic stuff on the inside. So if we look at the individual components, you've got a synthetic toe counter, which is actually it's a material I've never seen before. At least I can't remember seeing it. It's kind of a recycled counter material. And it doesn't seem like it's quite as fragile as the Tecovis really plasticky counter that I hate and that you guys have definitely experienced where if you step on your heel wrong on a cheap pair of boots or shoes, it just fractures and breaks. Like I'll show you real quick if, I, if I'm strong enough to break this little piece. Ooh, did it. So that's what I don't like. Because once that's cracked, it's cracked for good. At least with this counter material, it doesn't crack and fracture like that as easily. I'm sure if you bent it enough times, it would. But if you if you bent this enough, I'm sure you could get it to break, but it's a lot less fragile than the Tecovis. So that's one way they've saved money. The next way is they've used that same material as a lasting board. So underneath that pour-on foam and underneath the leather that tops it on the insole, you've got a, a layer of that recycled material in the place of what we usually see in a traditional boot as a veg tan insole or at least a veg tan midsole. You can see the difference here between the $300 Tecovis and the $200 Rhodes. You know, you can see that that's one material they've swapped out. Next layer down, you can see they've used two layers of compressed cardboard that sandwiches that steel shank. So on some of these more affordable boots, you can still see some compressed cardboard. And so that's not, saving them a ton of money because even in the Tecovis you've got some compressed cardboard and in the Lucchese's you also have some compressed cardboard. But you still have the cork filling, you still have that full steel shank, the full leather heel stack that's nailed all the way in to keep it secure. The counter cover on the inside is still an, a nice piece of leather that looks like it even has grain. It's better than half the counter covers. So is it worth the money? Is it worth $200? I think the best way to answer that question is compare it to the boots that are $100 more and a few hundred dollars more because really the only thing that changes between a lot of these boots and the roads is the fact that you don't have that veg tan insole. And the pros and cons of that is that the veg tan is usually preferred because it slowly breaks into the shape of your foot. It gives you that custom footprint inside of your boot, but it's harder to break in. It takes longer to break in. It's, it's a little bit harder underneath your foot versus this style of construction with a little bit softer, whether it's, it's fiberboard or this recycled material, it's gonna break in a lot faster. It's a lot more affordable, but it doesn't have the same durability and longevity as a big old slab of veg tan. So essentially, comparing these two boots, for $100 more, you get a layer of veg tan. For $100 less, you don't get a layer of veg tan. And so, so looking at that is, you know, it's a, it's a personal question to ask yourself for an entry level boot, do you need the veg tan insole for $100 more or are you okay experimenting with a little bit easier to break in, a little more comfortable, but less durable and less longevity in the roads? So is this the, the perfect first cowboy boot, your first entry level cowboy boot? I think it does it really well. It's $200, so it's the price of a nice pair of sneakers and it has that really subtle styling of the roper boot with the low heel, the squared heel, not a fancy design on the top, not crazy colors, a very subtle thing that you can just try the cowboy boot thing and if you hate it, you're only out 200 bucks rather than a thousand bucks or whatever and it's something that's gonna feel a little bit more close to what you're used to wearing if you're not used to wearing a high heel boot. So to me, it really is a really good option for your first cowboy boot and it might be the perfect first cowboy boot, at least for 200 bucks. So let me know what you guys think and what other cowboy boots you want us to cut apart in this series. So if you want a pair of these, I'll put some links in the description and thank you guys for watching and supporting the channel. It's what allows us to cut all these different kinds of boots in half to show you what you're spending your hard-earned money on for different price points. And uh, I love doing it. So thank you guys. See ya.